Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? So Kevin Roberts, one of our newest partners here at the Barbarian Hour, Jared, he is selling Resolite mats. He's uh, gunning to be their top salesman of the year for Resolite out of Pennsylvania. And uh, he's out of the Pacific Northwest, out North Idaho, uh, Eastern Washington. And he seems to be gaining momentum and we've been working with him a lot. Uh, I'll be out there for camps later on at his new facility, the dungeon. You've been working with him for years, right? Yeah. I've been working for, for Kevin for years. And then that was how Ian ended up at Oregon State is with uh, coach Kevin Roberts. So, you can check out Coach Roberts at robertswrestling.com. Nice, Coach. Can you give us a quick rundown on home use mats, how we contact Kevin Roberts for camps, and how we can get a hold of Kevin Roberts for home use mats and personalized Resolite mats from Kevin Roberts? Yeah, so I, thank you for mentioning that. I love being a Resolite rep, man. I love it. Great company. Best mats in the business, if you ask me, the gold standard. Um, so... Roberts Wrestling at Outlook.com is my email. RobertsWrestling.com is my website, which has all my contact info on there. Follow me at Roberts Wrestling on Instagram. Coach Haverdell, welcome to the Barbarian Hour. This is uh we I've had you on a couple times for shorts that we've done. We did a short leading up to the Illyria duels, which you guys won, right? Yeah. Yep. You guys won the Illyria duels, but just an introduction, quick introduction. Head coach of Brexville Broadview Heights. I'm saying that right, aren't I? You are. You are. Well done. So, But most people just know you guys as Brexville. Uh, you guys host the oldest holiday tournament in the United States of America, Scholastic. And you guys have been state runner-up. Correct me. How many times have you been runner-up in Division One? whether it's duels and tournaments? You know, Zeb, I really don't know. Um, I think four or five. Four or five. Yeah. Four. Okay. So I know you're runner up. You were runner up in both this year in the duels this year, and you were runner up in the state tournament at uh, Darby High School to St. Edward. In both of them, you were runner up to St. Edward. Yep. So uh, Todd also a state champion for Lake Catholic in was it ninety four? Ninety four. Yeah, I got that. I know. I I didn't think I'd get that one. So ninety four, you were state champ in ninety four. Were you guys ever team champs when you were there? No, r- runner up in ninety three. Runner up. Yeah. How did you finish in 93? Um, I, I probably cost us the team title. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. You coached there though then, right? I, I did. So I coached you there coach for Ryan uh, Simmons, our guy, Ryan Simmons. Yeah. Well, he, he wasn't on the team when I was coaching. Okay. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, so it was kind of a crazy story. So I was, um, I was competing at Mount Union and I had all kinds of injury problems. And it was just a nightmare. And my high school coach, Tim Armelli, uh, called me and said that um, John Gibbons, who was the PE teacher and football coach had left to go to Ed's and they had this opening. And in a private school, you just have to have your degree and being work, working towards your certificate. So I had already, I graduated in December and I was just doing my student teaching second semester. And so he's like, you come, they're going to hire you today if you want to come home. And so I went and talked to my college coach and was like, look, man, I, I got this job opportunity and this, this, this injury thing's not going well for me. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. And he was like, no, you're not. <laughs> and so he talked me to, you know, he's basically like, you're not a quitter and you don't want to live the rest of your life like that. And so Lake Catholic actually hired a long-term sub. I finished wrestling. I flew out from the NCAAs. I flew home and started teaching at Lake Catholic on Monday. And no so started, way. Yeah. And they, they, so that counted as my student teaching. So I got paid. So Mount Union came out to observe me like, I don't know, twice. I don't know. And that counted as my student teaching. And I, and I got paid to do it. It was, it was the greatest deal ever. Wow. Wow. What a way to start. Wow. So you started your coaching career there. How long did you teach and coach at Lake Catholic before it, it, it's just Lake Catholic and then Broadview Heights, Brexville, right? Those are the only two. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at Lake Catholic for basically like a year and a half. Cause I started halfway through that year, a little bit more than halfway and then the full next year. And then uh, I had, um, this is a little, I don't want to say embarrassing, but it was a tough decision for me. I took the head job at Lake uh, Mike Maddie was the head coach and, uh, we had just uh, agreed to flip roles. So he stepped down. I, I took over, I got announced. They did like the newspaper, the press release, all that kind of stuff. And then um, Brexel contacted me. And uh, at first I was like, ah, I just took this head job. I'm not interested. 
And then it was, again, it was Timar Melli was like, Hey, look, you, you should, you should uh, at least do the interview, right? I've never interviewed for a job. I just walked into Lake Catholic thing. And uh, I, I went out and did the interview per coach Armelli's request. And at that point, this building was like brand new. The facilities were brand new. It, um, you know, I was, I was uh, getting ready to, to, to get married. I was pre-engaged if that makes sense. I don't know. Um, and so you start thinking about life and family and, and um, yeah, I had no, no, no uh, intentions of taking this job. Like other, other people were coming out of their interviews and in like suits and ties. And I, you know, I had like a t-shirt and shorts. Cause I was like, I'm just going to interview, you know? Um, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. Are you there right now? I Are am. You- so, yeah. So we, we, uh, <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know I'm here a lot. Uh, so we lifted up five, we, we had practice at six. And so we went from six to eight and I just walked out of my classroom after that. Why don't you just drive home and do this? We could have done this when you're at home. You, you didn't, you, you know, you got three kids running around nine o'clock. <laughs> what are you doing? It's summer at nine o'clock. What do you do? You're out of your mind. I like it though. You I like it a little bit. You gotta be a little different. Don't you? Two hour then. But sometimes we like <laughs> to get going and we lose track of time and it's all good. Barber in two hour. Oh yeah. <laughs> I got to watch. I actually got to put him on the clock right now. Cause that's a something that's something, you know, we've been trying to be more respectful. We, I, I me, Zeb Miller, not, not to be confused with Jared was not respectful of Anthony Ashton's time. And I, I felt bad because the dude's just so nice. And he like accommodated us and did everything and never said a word. So when my timer goes off, you know, if you feel like you still want to talk, we'll go to overtime. You I know, know you uh, I, I, I can talk wrestling. You know, you tease me about it being my only hobby. So if there's, I, if we're going to talk, wrestling's the subject. I, I don't think we, I don't think there's any teasing. I think I asked you and you literally said, it's my only hobby. Yeah, I you- think it's actually just a fact not me teasing you. It's a fact. Am I wrong? No, no, you're not wrong. <laughs> okay. Just check it. Just check. I think you and your brother, Steve only have, well, he does football too. Doesn't he? he does do football. Yeah. You know, what's crazy is my, my brother, uh, his, his sport in high school was baseball. He was good. He played baseball in college and, uh, he didn't play high school football and he didn't finish his high school wrestling career, but yet he's a head coach of football and wrestling and not baseball. He's the head coach at Crestview for football. Yeah. Yep. Was it what two years ago? That. Yeah, a couple years ago. Yeah, He's two nuts. Sports. Yeah. <laughs> How much te- uh, teaching time does he have in compared to you? Uh, he doesn't teach there. He's like um, like an online truancy officer, or something like that. Like what Eric does, like Burnett does. Right, but for like an online program. Got it. So does he do? Is he into the STRS or don't you know? I don't even know to be honest. With you. I don't think so. I don't think Are so. you into the STRS? You know, you teach at a public school. Do you know that at least? I do. I do have, I have a handle. Oh, that's on. good. I, Cause I, I know you're in it, but I didn't know if you knew. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're, you're so tunnel vision, your physical <laughs> education, wrestling, daughters, wife. I think that's it. Is that it? Yeah. But I teach health now. So I've been doing health for uh, 11, 12 years now. No more, no more PE. I had middle school PE for a while and um, it's been health for the last 10 or so. Did you, did you voluntarily make that or were they just like, Hey, Todd, will you do this? Yeah. Yeah. So we had a, um, uh, a gentleman leave and they basically said, listen, next year you're going up to high school. And so it was kind of against my will, but I, I like it better now. Well, good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in the high school, you're not at the junior high, but the junior high is just right down the hill. Yeah. I think from a wrestling standpoint, being at the junior high was better for me because um, I was able to develop relationships with kids and get to know them before they ever entered the high school. There's, there's benefits to being at the high school in terms of, um, you know, just keeping your eye on the kids, but you know, I can follow their grades electronically now and whatever. So I thought being at the middle school was actually an advantage. Probably a bigger upside, right? Get, get some yeah. people in the program. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. So talk let's, kids let's, into wrestling. Let's talk wrestling, right? That's what right off the freestyle dual win, right? A first time ever, right? Let, let's talk that. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I don't know. It was interesting. I, I didn't, I guess I didn't know until um, the, the, the wrestling encyclopedia, Jack Gillespie, let me know that Ohio had never won. Um, so 16 I guess that, you 16, you cadets, right? Correct. Yeah. Never won that age. Had never won that age. Had made the finals one time, I guess, uh, maybe a couple of thirds, but had never won. Yeah. And so you Gillespie were tells you were you shocked. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, the, yes and no. Yes, because Ohio is Ohio and it's great wrestling. But um, I think Ohio, uh, the duels are really hard to win. And, and uh, for whatever reason, Ohio's had a difficult time probably getting their best kids to do the duels and especially the, that age group. So I, I guess it didn't shock me. 
Um, I do, I follow wrestling quite a bit. So I, I knew that we, you know, weren't, weren't killing it at that age group, but I wasn't aware of the fact that we had never won. Why do you, why do you think that is? We don't, we don't you know, do well at that age group. Schools. What do um, you focus on Fargo or they're kind of sitting it out or what? I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess a lot of this will be just my opinion, right? I could be a total idiot and be that, big, way off. But, yeah, that's why we're having you on. <laughs> um, I, I don't know that we, and I don't know why, but I don't know that we as Ohio do, do a great job with free so with the younger kids. Like, um, you know, the, what we used to call the schoolboys or the U14s, the novice. Like if you go to like our qualifiers and whatnot, there's just not a great turnout. There's not many kids. Um, where if you go to like um, Indiana for the regional, uh, there's a ton of kids from Indiana and Illinois at, at those age groups. We're in Ohio. It seems like we get a late start. I'm not positive as to why, but um, I, I feel like at U14, age group, we struggle a little bit. U16, we're starting to figure it out. Um, and usually by junior, we're, we're, we're pretty good. What's up, little guy? <laughs> What's up, dude? Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Here we get you the microphone. Do you guys have practice tonight? Yeah. No, Thomas. What'd you learn? Mm -hmm. Tell me, you turn out to swim. Tell him about swimming. <laughs> I got the ring. You got the ring? Good job, dude. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, is that time for your desk? Is your guest appearance over here on the Barbarian Hour? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I love you, buddy. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that was that was Thomas's cameo. Thank you guys for bearing with me there. Good. Uh, all right, buddy. I love you. Have a good night. We close that. Todd, you guys practice tonight. Yeah. What do you guys do? Because all your practices are freestyle and Greco because everything's geared towards Fargo. It's geared towards uh, U16, U17, U14, everything you do now, what used to be called cadet schoolboy and um, juniors. Mm -hmm. Everything is geared to that in, in the state of Ohio because it's out of season rules, right? But yeah. you guys actually literally adhere to those rules because you've had guys win Fargo. You've had multiple guys win Farvo, Fargo, right? Mm -hmm. Cadets and juniors, yeah. you know? So you guys adhere to those rules and you guys are definitely training really hard to get to that level. What, what is, why is it so important to get guys onto the Fargo team, out to Fargo, out to Oklahoma, out to Indianapolis, wherever the, the duels may be, right? Why is it so important to Brexville, for Brexville to do that? Um, I, I just, I, I think selfishly, I like freestyle better. So I think that's part of it. Um, but I think we see that in our kids. Like if, um, once you get them to accept freestyle um, and, and just kind of embrace it, I, I think they usually end up liking it better. Um, what happens sometimes I think is a kid that's been like really successful coming up Sometimes they resist the freestyle because uh, they're, they're worried. It's an unknown. It's, it's not comfortable to them. And, and so uh, once you get them to start doing it, I, I, I think almost every kid, nine out of 10, if not better, will say, hey, I like freestyle better. And so I think part of it for us when we were trying to build this program years ago was um, you can't teach experience. And so how do you keep kids wrestling in the off season, especially, you know, um, years ago when we took over, um, <laughs> the, the, the program was, was at ground zero. And so uh, to get them to keep wrestling, we almost had to trick them, right? So freestyle was something different. It was still wrestling, but it was different. And so um, we started playing around with it. And we had kids that uh, maybe made the national team. And I, we've had kids go to Fargo and go 0-2 and or 1-2. and And I feel like it's, it's changed their careers because of the camp and the people that they were around and just – the trip, you know, you feel like a, an NFL football player, a rock star getting on a charter bus and, and, and making the trip out there and just wrestling in the dome and this big national event, biggest tournament in the world, I think, um, in terms of participation. Um, and then, and then we started getting better. And then it was like, well, we had kids that were winning matches and then you had a kid that was an all American. And then you had kids that uh, made the finals and won. And then you saw the college exposure and the next generation of kids, I think saw like what it did for them. Like, well, it worked for that kid. And so uh, I'm going to do that. And so I think we locked out a little bit. Had we pushed kids into this freestyle thing and it didn't work, they just got beat up and it didn't take them anywhere. We probably wouldn't have got the next generation to do it, but, but we had some kids that did it and, and, and had fun and, and had some success. And um, then, then they came back to high school and they made the state tournament and then they placed. And so the next generations, I think kind of fell in line. So um, I think it's been huge for us in terms of building our program. You mentioned your, you know, kind of passions with freestyle. We, we talked earlier this week, you know, a lot of coaches are more folk style driven. 
if you had one thing to say, and then you mentioned, you know, we get a late start here in Ohio. If you had one thing for a coach, you know, got a lot of new coaches coming this year, I'm sure. Um, but what one's one tip you could give to a coach and getting involved in the freestyle scene that, that may be a little bit uncomfortable from a coach's standpoint. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I think, um, I think a lot of coaches are, I want to be careful how I say this. I don't want to offend anybody, but I think they're afraid of losing their kids. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, they're afraid of like, well, I don't know much freestyle. And so in order for my kid to do freestyle, he's got to go over to this club. And I'm afraid that um, I'm going to lose the kid you know, he's going to end up um, transferring or whatever. Um, and uh, Hey, listen, uh, it happens, right? We've had our kids transfer in. We've had our kids transfer out. Um, it happens. Um, but I, I, I think, uh, that most of us as coaches are just in it to help kids. Um, you know, it's funny. We were laughing on Monday in our room. We had kids from St. Ed's kids from O'Leary, kids from Wadsworth, kids from Maslin Perry, um, all in our room Monday training together. Um, and if you, if you'd ask me like, who, who's your biggest rivals, I would say St. Ed's O'Leary, Wadsworth, Maslin Perry, but, but it's, it's June and, and you got kids with a common goal trying to get better. And, um, I don't know. So I think I would tell those, those coaches to, to, I don't know, maybe trust a little bit that the people that are still coaching in June. Um, I don't know. They care about kids and just developing kids and um, the amount of time that they, the Eric Burnett's of the world put in um, just to help kids get better. Um, and, and so either, either those coaches are going to, have to either learn free this resale themselves or trust that these other coaches are, are generally have the best interest of their kids in hand. Um, but I think if these coaches would, would, would trust and get involved, I think they would see the benefits. Right. I guess my big thing is if there's a story to tell a story to be told, um, about the success of Brexville wrestling, I think a lot of it lays on the shoulders of Jeremy Johnson. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was talking about these people and we're like, Jeremy Johnson was in our room today. So, you know, we, we had practice at six, Jeremy Johnson is there. He's got drives a, a carload of Avon kids out there and, um, you know, we had, we had Ryan Lang in our room today. We had Brian Roddy in our room today, you know, and I was trying to explain to these kids after practice. I'm like, you know, Jeremy Johnson uh, was a state champion, an Ironman champion, a Fargo champion. He was fifth in the world at junior freestyle. He was a two-time division one, all American. He had wins over Wazowski and Kuhn and, you know, like he's done it. Um, you know, Ryan Lang, you know, four, four state titles, uh, Fargo title, uh, NCAA finalist, you know, Brian Roddy state titles and, and Fargo finalists. And, you know, so um, these kids are super, super uh, fortunate to have those people that are willing to come and, and give back and try to help these kids. Um, but you're right. Jeremy Johnson was, was kind of the poster child of what can happen. <laughs> he is the poster child of wrestling for what hard work can do. Cause I remember our Riverside guy, Zach Stokum used to just, when they were eighth, ninth and 10th graders, Zach Stokum used to just, fold him up like a lawn chair, just will just crushed him. And then by the time they're seniors, our guy doesn't make the state tournament and Jeremy Johnson wins the state tournament. It was wild to see his development because he was like, as an eighth grader, he was probably like a 500 wrestler. Yeah, I think, and I could be wrong on this. Jeremy could tell me, I think as an eighth grader, he wrestled one match because he, he wasn't, he didn't start for us at, at middle school. Like there was two heavyweights in front of him as an eighth grader. Yeah. So I think he only actually competed before like the middle school district. I think we entered him there, but I think prior to that, he had wrestled one match. That is wild. That, I mean, when you think about that though, like he is the poster child for the sport, not only Broadview Heights, Brexville, not just the Brexville bees, but like he is what the sport can do for somebody who's like, maybe like a bigger pudgier kid. Who's not doing other stuff. Right. And he like finds this sport and he like totally gravitates to it outworks absolutely everybody even the guys who are beating him right yeah. and he just like goes to this whole other level uh division one coach of the year this past year right yep i mean the guy is just like he epitomizes what the sport's about in my opinion yeah i i could tell stories all night on, on jeremy and, and the things that he did but you know i think when he got involved like he didn't have a youth career. So he didn't he didn't know any different and so when a coach said listen you just gotta outwork people he believed us and he just he just outworked everybody every day. And I tell this to our kids a lot. Everybody would say like, oh, Jeremy Johnson, he, did, he didn't get tired. He, yes, he did. He got exhausted. But he at some point accepted the fact that if he was exhausted, that other guy was done. Like if he could exhaust himself, he was in, he was in a good spot, you know. And um, his quick story, his match uh, to place at the, 
say term as a junior, he was wrestling a kid who was pretty good. I'll leave names out of, but ended up wrestling for Ohio state, whatever. And Jerry was losing and uh, just kept going and going and going and going and going and going and came back and tied it, took the lead, whatever. And the kid quit in the middle of the match. He like told the ref, he's like, I'm, I'm done and walked up the mat. Like the match wasn't over. It was a match to place at the state tournament. And he just was like, I'm, I'm done. This, this guy, I can't handle this and walked off the mat. Jeez. We call that wilting someone. That's what it, that's what it means to wilt someone. Yeah. You wilt them. They're just, uh, I'm, I'm talking, I can't do it. Yeah. I'm talking out. I'm done. I mean, that's amazing. But I think that you just don't call that a Tate in your house, Sam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tate did that. Tate, Tate gave up in a match one time that he was winning like eight to three. Oh, I thought he yeah. meant the other way. Cause Tate had a pretty good motor. No, Tate was wrestling Rich Delameter of Edison at the SBC. His senior year, he was the defending state champ. At St. Mary's. And he had like at St. Mary's. Yeah, it was it was at St. Mary's. It was in Jared's gym. And uh he was real sick. He was really sick. And uh uh he was winning eight to three, you know, four takedowns to three escapes at the end of the first period. And Rich Delameter's actually a pretty tough Edison guy, state place of Redison. And uh end of the first period. Tate's like, yeah, I'm done. And he tells Delamater to stick his hand out. He grabs his hand, shakes it, walks off the mat. George Bergman gives the classic George Bergman eyebrows. <laughs> and then like, and then my dad met him right before he went downstairs and it turned into a beating. <laughs> beating in the bowels of Sandusky St. Mary Central Catholic High School. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but no, he, because he was, well, he had heart surgery the next year because that, that was what his problem was. He, he had like a valve in his heart that wasn't sealing. Wow. So, I mean, it was legit, but I mean, yeah, you know, but he did so it. Jeremy did this at the state tournament then, huh? I mean, yeah, a little not, different than conference tournaments and state. Tournament. Yeah, way different. Even That's his senior wild. year, like uh, the, he won in the state semis over a kid who had pinned him like in 30 seconds the year before. And then uh, in the finals, he, he beat a guy who had beaten him previously as well. That's awesome. you know? Yeah. Who'd he beat? Mater? Who'd he beat? Yeah, yeah. Mater. Jamie Meter Played for the Browns. Big, gigantic dude. Yeah. From Valley Forge. NFL guy. Yeah, yeah. That is, just, I mean, that just shows, you know, like we could sit and talk about that guy all night. I mean, he is just, he epitomizes it though. Goes to OU, two-time All-American, right? I mean, it's just, it's an amazing story. I think now he, I think he'll, he trains with Stipe sometimes. I think he, that is like a wrestling partner for Stipe. Yeah, so that's another kind of funny story. So we were doing all our strength training with, with Strong Style and Marcus Marinelli is the, the owner and Stipe trains there. And they were looking for, and I forget who Stipe was about the fight, but um, they were looking for specific body types, um, you know, in terms of Stipe's training. And, and Jeremy kind of fit the, the mold. And I said something to Marcus. I'm like, hey, you know, we have this alumni and, you know, whatever. And, and so we kind of hooked him up and it was great. Um, and then, uh, Jeremy, he was having some problems with his back and they needed somebody else. We actually, uh, kind of passed the torch to Phil Wellington. So Phil's one of our assistants. And so he's been training with Stipe now. Um, so yeah, the two saw, I've seen that. I've actually seen that. And I bet you it was Cormier. You, you, you're probably right. I don't, I don't even remember. Um, I bet you it was Cormier because they're Jeremy actually, Jeremy's taller than Cormier. Daniel Cormier is only five ten. Sure. Yeah, sure. Isn't that wild? Like yeah. that guy is so athletic and powerful. And then for Stipe to beat him twice, I mean, it's amazing. And then, but that, you know, that, that right there, he's a sparring partner with, with Stipe Miocic, the <laughs> greatest heavyweight in UFC history, him and Phil Wellington, your assistant coach, Phil, J Jeremy was your, I don't think he, I mean, can we say greatest Brexville wrestler? If you want to go all the credentials all in, maybe, right. With all American yeah, finishes. I mean, I, I would say so. I don't so. know. I mean, between. Jeremy and Victor Vornovich, who just graduated, has got some pretty lofty um, credentials. Um, Austin Acid, you know, never won a state title, but won two Junior Fargo titles. Um, but yeah, Jer Jeremy's definitely up there. Yeah, that's an incredible, he's, he's an incredible story. Really good guy, too. Yeah, he's an awesome. awesome guy. Really awesome guy. That's awesome that you had uh, Rhett Lang, Ryan Lang in the uh, room tonight. Is he back from California? Yeah, so he's back in town and, and um, just traded some text and he came up today and, 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 just helped out. It was awesome. He's back nice. for good, right? He's not just visiting, right? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where what, what he's where he's going, but but definitely was home uh, and and short term here and uh, did a great job today with some of our kids. Nice. nice. So Todd, when you look at uh, what you guys have been able to do there, like you said, Ground Zero, the only name I can think of pre Todd Haverdo would be Craig Demetrius. That's literally the only Brexville name I can think of. Uh, Josh McAdams. That's a name. He ended up being an Olympian in the steeplechase. Um, that's but, right. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, did you so, t- did you coach him? No. So McAdams and Demetrius had left before I got here. So those uh, are the only two guys that I could think of, right? Yeah. That, that are were Brexville guys. I mean, you had a great holiday tournament. You had those two guys. You had an you had, you had a track Olympian. <laughs> that was on your wrestling team. <laughs> yeah, Demetrius was a runner up, I think. Right. Yep. Yep. So those are the like probably the two marquee names of Brexville wrestling before it was a two thousand Todd. When I took over? 99 or 2000. I took over in, uh, I think, 01. 01. Yeah. So 01, you come in, ground zero, like you're saying. What does it take to get buy-in to be competing with St. Ed's, Wadsworth, Illyria, LaSalle, Moeller, now Liberty, you know, now Kaufman, now all these, you know, these big-time teams, Perrysburg, Clay, all the D1 teams, Maslin, Perry. How are you guys consistently in that that group of names? Uh, I don't know. Patience for one, <laughs> that was the hardest part, right? I, I think um, looking back, I, I was, I think I was 20, maybe 23 when I took the head job here. Uh, and I thought I was ready. I was, you know, young and dumb and thought, well, we'll just teach double legs and outwork everybody. And this will be easy. And man, you know, that's about 2% of the job. Um, and so uh, looking back at, it, I don't, I don't, I definitely wasn't ready. I thought I was, but I, I, I wasn't. Um, and so I figured out a lot of things along the way, but, but it took a lot of patience. Um, I think one of the best things that happened to me was there's a, a guy by the name of Tom Mohall, who was uh, the head coach, two, two coaches prior to me, um, uh, but was still teaching here. And so uh, I was able to like, against his will, talk him into being an assistant. We couldn't get anybody to help coach here. Like, you know, people want to help out at good programs. Right. And so we couldn't get anybody to help. Um, I had, uh, um, my best friend at the time, Brian, Brian Frito. Uh, was driving out. He was living out in Menor, Euclid area. Um, and so he was the head assistant coach. And, and I talked Tom Mohol into helping and um, he had been a head coach before. And so he was able to like, kind of keep me centered. You know, I, I was, I couldn't connect to the parents. I was too young. They were, they were old enough to be my parents for crying out loud. Right. So I, I didn't understand the parenting side of it, you know? Um, and so that, that was huge for me. Um, that helped a ton in terms of getting kids to buy in I, patience. I, I don't know. That was really hard. I could tell some, some pretty kind of stupid stories, but um, I think my, my first year uh, at the sectional tournament it used to be two days. We had a, a kid on the team, Pete Carnabucci, who was, who was pretty good. Um, and maybe he had a buy first round or whatever, but I think day one of the sectional tournament, my first year, we won one match at sectionals. Wow. The entire first day we won one match. Ouch. Um, it was, it was awful. Um, and so we didn't win a duel. I remember we were, we were going to wrestle strong zone, a duel and their coach was kind enough to like, give me the heads up. He was like, Hey, listen, we're, we're over pointed. And so, um, we're going to wrestle our, our JV against you. And I was livid. I'm like, no, you're not. And right. And I was absolutely not. And he, there was nothing I could do about it. We showed up, they wrestled their JV and we won one match. <laughs> they, they almost shut <laughs> us out with their JV. Um, so yeah, like the next year, I actually got a hold of Eric Burnett because I felt like Eric was in a similar position to me, but just a couple years ahead. Right. So I, I, he's been a head coach. Maybe I think this was 20 for me and he's got to be 24, 25, something like that. 98. Jack was his first class. Okay. 97, 98. So he's like, yeah, like three, four years ahead of me. Uh, and you know, and, and so probably was similar in terms of building a Lear's program. And so, um, I called him my second year and, and was asking some questions and, uh, um, he invited us out to wrestle in a duel. We wrestled Illyria and Vermilion in a try. And uh, Illyria just destroyed us. And uh, Vermilion forfeited like five or six weights and we tied him. <laughs> and uh, the whole bus ride home, the kids on our team chanted like, we didn't lose. We didn't lose. It was, it was awful. <laughs> um, I, yeah. At the end of my first year, I actually wrote a letter of resignation. I'm like, I'm, I, I can't do this. I, I'm terrible. I can't do it. And, um, one of our, um, I think it was our middle school coach at the time, Tim Deanna kind of like talked me out of it, but, uh, I was done at the end of year one. It was, it was rough. How do you get through that? How do you, how do you get over the hump and believe you said Tim Deanna talked you out of it, but how do you like, how do you like, what do you, what's the soul surging? What do you do in the off season? How do you like, Next step. what's your game plan? I mean, late Catholics are really good. Like Catholics had NCAA finalists. Uh, late Catholics got all Americans. Like Catholic is a runner up or champ, you know, once every decade. Right. I mean, yeah. could have just gone right back that had taken your arms wide open is my guess. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. It was tough. There was a kid at Lake um, Anthony Constantino, 
who, and again, I was, I was young. I mean, I was, you know, that, that young coach that was still able to run and wrestle every day. And uh, we had a, just a great relationship and, and Anthony had been a finalist the year before the two years before. Um, and, and so leaving him was really tough. I was, I was leaving our practices and, and I lived in Euclid. So I was driving home and getting together with him and working out. And, and I can remember, I think it was, it took me like, I think it was four years before we even qualified anybody at the state tournament. And so we would get like eliminated from the district tournament. I drove to Akron Firestone and, you know, watched the Lake Catholic compete. So um, I, I don't know to answer your question. I think we had a couple um, middle school kids that were pretty good. Pat Zamiria, uh, Mike Pushback, Jim Nemunitis, uh, Ryan Marks, and uh, they bought it um, and they were young. Um, and that, that was a big difference. But I think the, the biggest um, step for us as a program was Kyle Lang. Uh, deciding to stay at Brex Hill. That was huge. That was huge for us. Um, because it just, I don't know, it showed people that they could win at Brex Hill. even though it was Kyle and it was the, the Lang family and Ryan had won four titles and everybody just assumed he was going to Ed's and, and, you know, you, Jeb, you know, Kyle likes to kind of beat to his own drum and um, he decided to stay. And um, now when we were going to the freestyle qualifiers and going to the Fargo trials and going to Fargo um, and there was, there was, Brexel people winning, you know, um, primarily because of Kyle, but it, but it helped Pat Zamiri and Ryan Marks and, and Mike Pushback and Jimmy Nemanitis, like it showed them the way, you know? Um, and so I, I think Kyle Lang um, was, was the pioneer uh, for us building the program. That's crazy that you bring that name up because, because he won, did he crush somebody in the state finals in like 30 seconds as a senior year? Did he like pin someone? Yeah, it wasn't quite that quick, but he, he was up by 10, I think, at like the end of the first period, ended up getting a, a fall in the early second period. Yeah. And Over a kid who was a runner up the year before. So it was a, against a pretty good kid. Yeah. So, like, you know, when, like you're saying, like in the past, like I think Bertines are from Brexville. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe 20 years ago, if you guys, what you are and are you what you are now, guys like that don't leave. I mean, we're sitting here, you know, it's right. guessing game, right? It's, it's, Shoulda, woulda, coulda stuff, but that's huge. Like you're saying, his brother was a four-time state champ, NCAA finalist, and then the guy decides to to stay at his home school. I mean, that that speaks volumes in this day and age. And now I think it's actually going to get worse because that you know there's just not as much parity in the state of Ohio. You know, I mean, we have all these great coaches that just retired. Um, if you look, Solon, Tony Giovanni, right? Uh, Milkovich is still actually at Maple, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had this like rash of really good coaches that retired, right? I mean, they just a left lot. a lot, like, like a lot, a lot, couple right? Years, man, right? Right, and like, Riggs, Jordan, Jordan, right. Urbis, I think we're Riggs, all Urb yeah, I mean, th those are just the ones off the top of my head. Riggs, Urbis, I think Dan Milkovich was he's been done in the last five years. They've had all these people that have just been like done, right? And you know, they're getting older, I get that, but it's like the quality of Ohio wrestling, our depth is just not what it was. It's just not what it was. I mean, it's that simple. So I think that, you know, you guys are going to get more guys that you, you know, that usually maybe would not have gotten in the past. You've become a magnet. It's, it's actually a, a testament to you and your, your staff and your program. I, you know, I think, um, I think you're, you're right from a standpoint that, um, you know, as parents, you want to put your kid in the best situation for success. And so you have programs that have proven that they can be consistent. Right. Um, but I think that the thing about Brexel is the academics here are incredible. And, and so that's, you know, a lot of people think, well, they moved there for wrestling. And I think, um, yeah, maybe that had something to do with it, but, but the education here um, is, is incredible. So I, I, I don't want to shortchange that. I, I think a lot of people move here because of that. How's my guy dry poultry? Doing? First off, if you want to talk education at Brexville, I got two guys there. I got, I got, I got dry poulter. And then of Dietre. course I've got Dietre who used to perform, oh, yeah. just, just murder me, <laughs> just mauled me as like a freshman. And he's a senior, just so many felonies committed on me. <laughs> and then dry poulter. I lived with dry poulter. Yeah. You know, and you know, dry poulter's uncle is our biggest donor at Kent state. Yep. You know, Kyle's uncle, uh, uh, Bill, Bill dry poulter. I love Bill dry poulter. <laughs> Um, he's one of our big donors. He's a champ for Kansas State, and they're up to New York. And uh, <laughs> Kyle Dryaporter, he's he's funny. I like that guy. He's a good guy. But Detroit, I mean, people like that. Those guys are they're 
they're top notch at their job, right? They're really serious about it. Yeah. That's why yeah. when we talk about a Brexville is one of the best. I mean, I'm talking about two guys who are top of the field could work at any school and they work at Brexville. Yeah. We're, we're, we're super fortunate. Like, so the academics here are, are incredible. So you guys have, you had the Tupas there, right? Mm-hmm. Were all the Tupa boys uh, D1 football players? Yep. yep. What about what the girl end up doing? Is she still she there? She went to like, uh, maybe like Wyoming or something like that to play volleyball. And then okay. I think she, transferred, she was D1. But- yeah, yeah, they won a state title here in volleyball when when Emma was on that team. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you had the Tupas. They did they win the state when Tom Tupa was on the football team. Yeah, yeah, eighty three. Yep. <laughs> he was the he was one of the greatest punters ever, but he's a quarterback. I don't think a lot of people know that. Yeah, didn't he score the first two point conversion in NFL history? I think something right? crazy like that. He played in the NFL for a really long time. Yeah. Did he play for Cardinals. Who did he play for? I think he played for a bunch of people. Yeah, I mean, you go Wikipedia him. Like sometimes I think that he would get thrown in as a backup quarterback because he's like super valuable because he can punt and he can play backup. He can play third string quarterback. Yeah. And if you know anything about Cleveland and you can just pay attention to a game, you figure out that someone like that's obviously super valuable. <laughs> They're kind of like people that don't exist anymore. But, but Brexel's known for right your, your gymnast team, right? Gymnastics, I should say, right? A lot of sports there, you know, thrive, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Braxel is, um, it's St. Ed's of, of gymnastics. I, I, I should know my history better because my daughter was a freshman on the team this year, but they won, I don't know, 17 or 18 in a row now. Right. And then maybe 21 total, something like state that. Title? They've won that many state titles in a row. Yep. And your daughter is a freshman on the team. Yeah. It was, it was a crazy year for me, man. Um, to have a, a, a daughter at the high school, I had her in class, <laughs> uh, and I'm a health teacher. Um, so I had her in class. Uh, she was on the gymnastics team. Um, and it's the same season as wrestling. And so that was, that was difficult for me. It was, it was, it was, um, harder than I thought. Yeah. So a lot going on. Okay. So this is a question for either one of you, Jared or Todd, hopefully Todd, the guest answers it, but how awesome is it being a a hashtag girl dad? What's it like being girl dad? He's, I, I just learned he has four. So he's trumped me. I'm, I'm at, I got three. Um, it's awesome. You know, everybody says to me like, oh man, you, you gotta be dying and not have a boy. Like, I, I don't know because I don't have one, but I, I'm, I'm really great. I love having girls. Um, I'm afraid that if I had a boy, I'd be the, I'd be the psycho dad. And, and so, um, I love going to the, I don't know anything about gymnastics. I don't know anything about soccer. I love going to their sporting events and just sitting down and just, just being a parent and, and watching. And um, I, I don't know, having, having girls is at least up till now has been fantastic. <laughs> you hit it on the head. Uh, that's I, I enjoy it. I can be dad, you know, enjoy it. I have a feeling if I had a boy at wrestling, I think uh, my Sarah Zeb, I think she'd be Julie 2.0 uh, in the stands. Oh, man. <laughs> I've got to experience my mom at the college matches and, I mean, she knew she's too. We we're in the huh? same league. Yeah, Come same on. league. You're right. Yeah, but you got right. How would you describe her? Intense. Intense. She knew what she was yelling about. Put it that way. Yeah, she knew what was going. Her on. brothers, you know, wrestled and everything, so she knew. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed. But Todd, how long did it take to get the Lake Catholic, like the the wanting to be at Lake Catholic and the helping out with? How long did it take to get out of your blood? I mean. I don't know. I I think, I think the Constantino thing was really tough for me because he was a kid that I was really, really connected to. And so that first year was really, really hard because Anthony, um, he graduated, went on wrestling at Columbia. Um, And so when he left, it got a little easier, but there was still a group of kids that I was connected to. And so probably when that group that was there while I was there, you know, that, so it took about three years. Um, But at the end of the day, I loved my time at Lake Catholic. I'm still a Lake Catholic alum. I'd still do anything to help their program. Uh, We still have a good relationship with them. Uh, But I, you know, that first year was really, really difficult, um, primarily because Anthony. And then, and then I think the next couple of years, and then it just, I didn't know those kids as well after that, you know? So you had a couple of seniors, right? Big freshman class this year. Obviously, Voinovichs are gone. What's next season looking like? You know, young class, you know, freshman, what's coming up? Yeah, so we we graduated, um, and I don't uh, don't want to disrespect him, but I think the the best class I've I've ever had um, was our senior class this year. Um, just a really really good group of kids, hardworking kids that I, I think um, did some pretty cool things in the sport. So that's going to be a tough tough group to replace. 
Um, you know, we, we went, not to get off subject, but we, we were able to, we wrestled at the state term without Ben Venadia, who was ranked six in the country and um, had, had bonus pointed everybody in the weight. He's probably 30 points at the state tournament. Um, to be runner up without him, I think speaks volumes for the group that we had. And so really tough group to, to replace. However, um, we have some good kids coming in. Um, you know, a few freshmen coming in that we're really, really excited about. Um, you know, one of a guy that's coached with us for years, Kevin McPherson, his son's going to be a freshman um, for us and, and made the national team. So he made the Fargo team as an eighth grader up at 182 pounds, which nice. for big guys, ain't easy. Um, you know, uh, Rizzo's brother, Evan Rizzo's a hammer. And so he's coming in and, and um, Chase Pluhar's got a younger brother, Caden, who, who, who's pretty dang good. And he's finally, we were worried he wasn't going to be big enough for the weight, but he's, he's getting big now. Um, um, Sean Earl's little brother, Logan Earl. So, so it's like this, this family of, you know, brothers and coaches. And so We're familiar uh, with the program. Which yeah. Makes it easier. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool. It's fun. It's fun. Um, I don't know that we can replace the group we lost, but uh, we're excited about the group that's coming in. Vanadia brothers, Vanadia yeah. brothers are hammers and which one of the twins placed, right? They both placed. They both placed. Yeah. That is amazing. Right. Yes. First, can I get this out of the, I gotta get this one off my chest. I think we've talked, I'm scared of the old man. Everybody is. The old man is a big, gigantic, loud dude. Yeah. He, me, like he's like the size of like Lurch. He's a yeah. massive dude. He's got giant hands and his fingers are all going in the wrong directions. And yeah, he he's um very intense. But let, let me let me clear the air on something. The, Tony Vanadia, dad has a giant, giant heart. Um, and, and not everybody gets to see that. They they see him. Uh, and, you know, or hear him, I should say, in the stands or pacing or screaming. Um, and he is intense. But you talk about a family that will do anything to help anybody. It's the Vanadia family. Um, and Tony Vanadia, as intense as he is, he's the first person um, patting another kid on the back if something goes wrong. And, you know, um, trying to build up another, you know, younger kid that maybe took a loss. Um, just great, great, great people. So... I guess the big thing is, you know, the tag brothers left. One went to UNC, older one went to USC, NC. Uh, Julian went to the OTC, right? Uh, they both went to the OTC, and then they both ended up at uh, UNC. But they're staggered a year. One's a year ahead of the other one. Yes. Yep. Okay, so you lost to them both at the same time. They both yep. won state titles for you. Yep. And then you don't have them the next year. Yep. Right. So Victor Voinovich won the state title for you as a freshman and he won it as a senior as a bookend state champ. Didn't have his as a, ju as a junior. Yep. And then Kale was third for you guys this year. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've, this has happened to you before. It's not like this is your first th time that two nationally ranked brothers leave your program. Right. And it doesn't sound like it's a Todd Haverdell problem at all. It doesn't sound like it has anything to do with Todd Haverdell. Right. And I've never heard you say boo or negative thing about either one, any of those four kids. I've never heard a negative thing out of your, mo your mouth about them. When you see these kids get these other opportunities, it, it, it sucks for you. There's no question, right? But what's it like? What's it feel like when guys leave? What I've learned through coaching is that parents make decisions because they think that they're right for their family. No, no parent makes a decision and says, hey, I, I think this is the wrong thing to do and I'm going to do it. Um, and so... Look, you know, Victor Voinovich is, is um, you know, with Jeremy Johnson, Austin Acid, arguably the best kid that's ever put on a Brexville singlet. Um, super, super proud of his career. What Cale did as a freshman was incredible. That kid, a lot of people don't realize he didn't really start competing until like seventh grade. Uh, he'd been around the sport, but never really got into it. And so to do what he's done from sixth, seventh grade to now, even from December to March, was, was incredible. Um, turned over a, a number of losses. Um, and, and so to finish third as a freshman, um, it's a huge loss. Um, but again, the, the family is in a great situation. Um, you know, dad got a great job out there. Kale's going to wrestle for Stillwater high school. Um, they got a, they got a hell of a program out there. He's going to have great partners. He's going to, you know, be able to, to train alongside, you know, I'm, I'm imagining in their RTC with college kids around and John Smith around. And, um, I, look, do I want them to leave? Absolutely not. Um, numerous people have said, Hey, are you upset? Are you mad? Not an ounce. If the family is in a better situation, God bless them. I, I think I talked to um, Vic, Victor, and Kale all today, yesterday, 
um, you know, via text. And um, I, I have no hard feelings whatsoever about the situation. Tags. When tags left, I mean, it was it was your first time that that happened. Yeah. Was it different with the tags? Was there anything different about that situation compared to the Voinovich's? Well, I think what was different about that was um, that uh, elite athlete program that they were they were kind of um, trying to get off the ground at the OTC. And so that was kind of new, um, you know, and so uh, they were looking for some good kids around the country to go out there and live and train. And, um, you know, the tags were two of the best kids in the country. And so um, it was what it was, you know, they went out there and trained and, and Gabe ends up making a junior world team and taking a bronze. Right. So um, they're, they're in a good place. It's all good. What are you looking forward to in Fargo? Who are you, who are you looking at some up and coming guys that, you know, you think are going to exceed their, you know, people, expectations yeah i mean i guess you know speaking in terms of brexel um you know we have um I think we had nine kids qual- 10 kids qualify uh one, one's not going to go and then obviously kale moved out to, to oklahoma so i think we'll have eight compete from brexel um and so you know i don't want to leave anybody out but you look at the duels brock herman and luke vanadia had exceptional um national duels um uh, luke vanadia uh, was, was on our B team and Cam McDaniel gets hurt and we, we move Luke up and he goes seven and oh, um, beat the U 15 world team member. Um, and you know, uh, what your results of the duels are usually a pretty good indicator of how you're going to do in Fargo. So, um, I think that Luke Vanadia is, is going to be in the mix out there and, and Brock Herman just had a giant off season. I mean, he, he's, he's been on fire. Uh, he, he did, you know, take a couple losses at the duels, but I think one was on him and it was a good, good little lesson for him. And then the other one um, got into a, a, a kind of a controversial finish. Uh, I, we thought he had won five, five, and then they threw the, 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 the brick just to challenge and somehow a point came out and whatever, but it was, the, it was against a really, really good kid who was a beast. The last duel? Was that in the yeah. Last duel? Yeah. It was, it was, it was wild um, the way it ended. I, I still don't understand it, but, but it, it doesn't matter. I think that, it, um, he, he, he wrestled exceptionally well against a kid. That's probably one of the best kids in the country. And so I feel like Brock and Luke for sure heading into Fargo, um, can make some noise. And then, and Max and 80, I think ended up five and three out at the duels. And so, um, you know, and those guys are all U 16 guys that they're young. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about the, um, about just taking a good group of kids, a big group of kids, uh, out to Fargo. Is there a goal that you try and hit? Is there like, I want X amount of guys going to Fargo. I want, I want, I want everybody trying to go to Fargo and I want X amount of people to get on the team. Is that ever a goal that you try and hit? No, I mean, I, I don't know. I, yes and no. We don't really set a number. I mean, the goal is to get as many kids on the Fargo team as possible and then we'll figure it out. Um, there's some kids that maybe we knew weren't going to go, even if they made it, but Hey, make the team and then, and then let's figure it out. So I, I don't know that we say, Hey, we want 10 on the team. It's just um, get as many kids to, to qualify to freestyle state as possible. Get as many guys to go to the regionals as possible. Get as many guys to go to freestyle state as possible. And then let's see how many guys we got on the team and then we'll figure it out from there. So I, you know, I think 10 is a, is a really, is a good number. I don't, I don't know the most we've ever had, um, but, but 10's up there. Do you talk about the past stop sign guys? Do you have any stop signs hanging up in the room? Do you talk about when guys win stop signs, obviously to get other guys motivated to win stop signs? Is that something that you talk about? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, you know, again, I told you Jeremy Johnson was in the room today, right? And so he's a great exemplar. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think um, talking about that kind of stuff, uh, I'm sort of repeating myself, but it, but it proves to the kids that are in the room that like, it can be done. It can be done in this room. You know, um, Jeremy Johnson won Fargo. Austin Acid won juniors twice. Um, Julian Tag won, won Fargo. So, um, you know, there's been four Fargo titles that came out of our program. Um, and, and uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I know St. Ed's has had more. I don't, I don't know who else has had more. It's, it's hard to win Fargo. Um, so I think by, by talking about guys that were all Americans, you know, Victor was in the junior finals and lost to Echemendia, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And so, yeah, you, you, you use them as examples. We, we were talking about um, Austin Acid's final against Sean Russell and, and, you know, got a single leg up in the air when he was losing and Tomahawk finished into a lace, transitioned to lace, won him his, his first Fargo title, you know? And so you use those wow. examples. Yeah. The big one for me is we were talking off air is, you have a league rival that's also a top 25 team in the country, right? You have a team in your league. Yeah. 
Wadsworth, did that, they beat you on like the team? The, the, the when you guys competed in the league, I think last year, the COVID year when we lost the year, didn't they beat you at the league tournament? Okay, so the year that we didn't have the state tournament, I think we beat them in the league tournament. They beat us in a duel. I think is how it went. It seems to go back and forth a lot. And we had I had Clay on a couple of weeks ago. Clay Wanger, the head coach at Wadsworth. And he loves the rivalry, you know, and like you were talking off camera about you brought a guy out in the duel this year in December, right? Who'd never wrestled, who had literally never been in a live match before that duel. Didn't you say you had a, the what, Perrysburg forfeited to him? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we didn't have a heavyweight this year. And so we talked um, uh, two kids off the football team. One was a freshman, one was a junior. And the junior Kirk Dasso is a, just a massive human being, just a giant man. Um, but had never, never wrestled before. And um, he, we, our first duel of the year was, was Perrysburg, but they didn't have a heavyweight. So they forfeited. So, so the second duel was the Wazra duel. And so at this point, he, he literally had never wrestled a match in his life. Um, didn't really know, you know, like it's, it's hard. Like when do you teach, like, don't lock hands. <laughs> like, how do you explain a stalemate to a kid? How do you, you know, it's, uh, they, they, they make the mistakes and then you explain it. Right. I mean, I don't know, maybe I do it wrong, but it's not like they want to practice like, Hey, here's a full Nelson. Don't do that. You know? Um, and so there was so much that he just didn't know. And um, we get into this dual meet and it was no secret that it was going to be close. Uh, they had one of their studs out of the lineup in, in hacker. Um and, and the dual meet gets going and, and you're doing the math going, holy smokes, uh, it, this, this is going to come down to heavyweight. And um, they actually bump their 220 up. They had a freshman heavyweight who's going to be a beast. Um, but, but for him, that's a big moment, right? You got this ninth grader in this giant duel coming down to him. And they made the decision to bump up a 220 who they had to get above 215 to be eligible to go up to 220 to step out there and wrestle our kid, but, but they're smart, right? They, they, this is a kid that they've never heard his name before. So they know he's, he's new. He's a junior and he wasn't on our team last year. He wasn't on JV last year. He wasn't out there as a freshman, like they're smart people. And so they make the decision to bump this kid up against our just massive human being. And uh, I, I just, I think you'd have to understand wrestling to truly appreciate the effort by both kids. Um, you know, our kid, never wrestled him in a, in a match in his life. And here he is, the dual meet comes down to him. The, 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 the gym is rocking. And this other kid who probably, you know, weighs 210 and they had to stuff some water in him to get him over 215 uh, is taking on this kid who weighs 285. And um, it was, it was um, one to zero. Uh, they were winning in the third. We put our kid on bottom. We let him go in the second because we were afraid he's going to lock hands. Like, you know, like just, we didn't know what we were doing. So we just let him go right away. So zero, zero first, we let him go one, zero in the second. And then um, we kind of reluctantly put our kid on bottom in third because, you know, when you don't know how to wrestle um, the guy throws a power half, big guys roll over. And, and so we, you know, we put him on bottom and he did an awesome job, but the Wazer kid did a really good job of breaking into his belly and he's getting tired now, you know, and uh, they go out of bounds and there's like, no call me at the time, but like 18 seconds to go. And our kids exhausted. And he doesn't know what's going on. And, and, and I think I made a huge mistake as a coach because I'm like, Kirk, Kirk, if you get out, we win. Just get away. You just got to stand up and push away and we win. And he has this like just adrenaline rush and he stands up and the kid kind of returns him and he just stands up again. He turns and he cuts and there, our bench goes crazy and our kid stands up and looks over at me. And there's like four seconds to go. And the Wadsworth kid took him down. <laughs> and we lost. It was wild. Yeah, never uh, seen anything in my life. Uh, but you don't you don't make the state finals. I don't think if, if you don't win that duel, you don't make the state finals. Maybe right? Yeah, I don't know. Right? Who knows? Uh, there was a there, definitely some lessons to be learned there. And then we wrestled them in the state duel semis, and they had Hacker back, and so they had their lineup intact. And um, you know, there there had to be a, a, a match flipped somewhere. And and Rizzo and Jameson Jackson had this crazy rivalry all year long at 182. And so Jameson beat him in the duel. And, and, and so Wadsworth beat us. And then in the state duels, we had to flip something. And uh, so they had Hacker back, but Kale Voinovich beats him. So even though they had him back, it didn't change anything. And he beat uh, him up. He beat him up really bad. Yeah. Kale's pretty good. <laughs> really, he he's beat pretty him good. up bad. And then this Rizzo guy. Yeah. I, that, I don't know if that's, 
I don't know if that's Brexville wrestling you're teaching. He <laughs> lost a 17 to 14 match to Perrine. Yeah. He lost a bunch. Or he won and lost a bunch of matches like that this year, didn't he? Like 14, 11, and 15, 12. Like he wrestles like that, right? He's got crazy hips. I can't say enough about this kid. He, his freshman year, he tore his ACL, wasn't able to wrestle, um, had that fixed. Um, sophomore year, uh, just taken as lumps, but comes the district tournament and he's on, makes a state tournament. Junior year, kind of year gets going. He's taking some lumps, but doing okay. Um, makes the district finals, makes a state tournament, and then we don't have it. And then this year, again, I don't know exactly, but I think he was like 0 and 8, 1 and 8 to start the year. Uh, but every kid he wrestled was ranked yeah. like top 10. And he wrestled Perrine, Hivner, Evans, like y- you name it. He, he wrestled them. Um, but he's got these crazy hips and he just doesn't get rattled. And so I don't know what his final record, he was probably close to 500 going into like the sectional term. He's a two-time state qualifier um, and, and uh, you know, finishes on the state podium, finishes six in the state. I think all five guys that finished in front of him all had already committed to division one. That's amazing. Cause I remember that when, when I was at the Illyria duels, it was Brosky, it was uh, Evans, it was Hivner, it was Perrine, it was him. Yep. And then Marion Pleasant had a good guy too. Yeah. Like, yeah. What is going on here? What is, what is 182 doing? Yeah. Yeah. It was really, wild. He had a really, you know, you always want more. Don't get me wrong, but he had a really, really cool career. Really kind of proud of his effort. Watching him is super entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Like super entertaining. Cause he looks almost undersized for the weight. Yeah, but he's never out of a match. His hips are crazy. Yeah, and he's always doing like crazy just stepovers and all this. I mean, the per- watch the Perrine match because I think Perrine takes him down maybe 10 times, <laughs> but he catches Perrine on his back, and you know what that does to a match where a dude's taking a guy down a bunch of times, yeah. right? It makes it like – it was like 14 to 14 at one point, yeah. I want to say. Yeah. And then I think Perrine got out and got a takedown maybe. It was – I was like, what is he doing? It was wild, though. Yeah. Like wild, like and that, so his younger brother's coming in. Yeah, Evan. Yep, he'll be a freshman. Jeez, oh, Pete. Hey, the guy who really impressed me at the state duels and free Herman. Oh yeah. my, I was like, who is this guy? Brock Herman is the real deal. Oh, and he's, he's like physical too. Yeah, and he's young, so he's a sophomore. And he's still a cadet or U sixteen. So he's he's. My, and my point is like his ceiling's still way up there. When you talk to like college coaches, right? You're yeah. like, you got a guy like that with a huge ceiling, right? Rizzo's got a lot of room for growth too. Herman's got a lot of a lot of room for gro- uh, growth too. And you've had the really good guys though, right? You've had the number one guy in the country in Victor Voinovich. What do you say to a college coach about these guys? Because you talk to a lot of college coaches. You know, Vanadia is going to Purdue. You've got Hatcher. Is Hatcher still at Cornell? Yeah. Yeah, Hatcher's at Cornell. So you got D one guys. Uh, one of the Tag brothers is still at UNC. So you're always putting guys at D1, obviously Voinovich going to Oklahoma State. But how, how do you talk to college coaches about these guys when you see an upside like that? Like when you see a, a Jeremy Johnson type upside, how do you talk to a college coach about that? You know, I don't know. This is not not probably an interesting answer, but I, I, I just think you're really honest with them. I mean, at the end of the day, I want those I want those coaches to continue to recruit in our program. Right. So um, I, I think you, you call a spade a spade. You, you tell them. Uh, what they're really good at and where you think, you know, uh, they can excel at. And maybe, and then, you know, you don't ever talk bad on a kid, but like, Hey, he struggles on bottom. He, whatever the case may be. Right. But I, I think you just, you tell the truth. That's a good answer. Yeah. What's wrong with that answer? It's not, well, it's not like you, you didn't just like, uh, Hey, Zub, look over there. There's a bird and run away. It's not like, you, well, you, you know, know I don't think what are you talking about? It's a great answer. I don't have some like secret, like no. script that I give to these college coaches. Like you just, the, 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 yeah, these college coaches are smart and the, the results speak for themselves. They've watched these kids wrestle. They know and the college coaches are, are asking more about their work ethic, their character, that those are the questions that you're answering. You know, how do you keep such a, you have the stable of assistant coaches. It is amazing. Actually. I'm like, how does he get this guy to coach? You have an unbelievable stable of assistant coaches. You know, Ricky Dubell is over here at Kenston. He was a former assistant coach of yours. That's just an example, but, a lot of these guys are starting to branch off then, right? But you're, you're able to keep a lot of them. How do you get such great assistant coaches at Brexville? I, you know, I'm really OCD. So it's, it's hard for me sometimes. I like consistency. And so um, one of the things that I had to learn to do better is be flexible. And so for a guy like Phil Wellington, who's just done an amazing job with our big guys, 
Um, his, he doesn't work a nine to five or he works a nine to five job. He doesn't have a job where he can be at three o'clock practice. And so it takes some creativity. Um, but, but it's, it's, it's been, I think it's been really good for the kids too. So you get so caught in the, the, the monotony of go to school, go to the locker room, get dressed, go to practice, go home, do your homework. And so what we're able to do is take a guy like Phil and he'll roll in at six o'clock. And so he'll have a different kid each day. And so I'm able to say, Hey, Ben Venadia, go home after school today. And he goes home and he sees the sunlight, you know, and he, he, he it's, you know, true. It's, yeah. it's true. Yeah. And so I think that it's, it's really been a win-win to have, um, you know, you, you can't have Phil at three, but he's an amazing coach. And so how do you make it work? And um, I, I think communication is probably the answer. A lot of it, I'm a texting freak. So just te- constantly texting back and forth about, um, who's with Phil today and who's with Aaron acid today and who's with Ryan Marks today. And you got Kyle Roddy back in the room, but he can't get in here till this time or wh- whatever the case may be. Right. But it's just constantly communicating and moving the pieces of the puzzle around. But I think that makes them feel valuable too. Right. I mean, and about- the guy trains with steep. I mean, <laughs> you got an assistant coach who trains with steep. Come on, man. Yeah. Yeah. Even Hatcher's senior year, they were using him a little bit too. Can you imagine being an 18 year old kid and, and training with Stipe? Like, like hanging out with your buddies, watching the UFC and being like, yeah, I'm training partners with him. That's you know? so wild. Yeah. Oh cool. my God. Crazy. dude. Just yeah. Bonkers. Totally. Zeb, bonkers. Zeb knows what that feels like. Right. Zeb. Stipe stole my lunch. It was terrible. <laughs> Stipe is a super light on his feet, like an incredible athlete. I'll tell you this, when, when, Jer- when they first had Jeremy come in to train with him, he was fresh off of being a division one American. And I'm telling Marcus Marinelli, I'm like, Hey, look, man, like this guy is the, he's the elite of the elite in wrestling. Like Stipe was really good, but he hasn't really wrestled, wrestled in a lot of years. Yeah. I thought Jeremy was going to just put it on him. And I was stunned at how even and competitive um, Stipe was with Jeremy right, right out of the get go. And he's massive. <laughs> and Stipe is he's mad like Stipe is huge. Stipe is six four. He's huge, right? Yeah. His shoulders are wide. He's like super rangy, but he's like really athletic, right? Uh we oh, so Jared, we're gonna put this man on overtime if he wants to go. Do you want to go a little bit overtime? He's gotta well, drive home too, Zeb. Remember? I'm, I live home. like three minutes from here. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> overtime is brought to you by Defense Soap and Defense Wipes. <laughs> Defend what you have built. I need you to know that. I need you to know that. Todd. So they're going to bring this, uh, this session of overtime. So you have all these amazing assistant coaches. You you're coordinating all these assistant coaches. You say communication is the main factor to it. Are you texting the coaches, the kids? Hey, Phil's not going to be here today. Is this something that's prearranged the night before? Do you do this during the day? All the above. I, I again, I, I, I'm, I'd be half embarrassed for somebody to follow me around for a day. I mean, it's, uh, the amount of tax that I send, um, the, the email that we sent out daily that, that, that summarizes, you know, uh, what happened yesterday, uh, what's going to happen today, that practice plan is attached, you know, each coach, you know, if I need them to do something specific, the plans for the rest of the week, the itinerary for the weekend, you know, so that goes out daily. And I'm just constantly uh, taxing each coach about, um, you know, just different guys that they've connected with and, and, and hey, we need to... Um, uh, give this look to so-and-so today at practice. And I need, I want to get these two partnered up and, and I'm sending so-and-so home after school today because they're meeting coach so-and-so in the evening. And it's just, and it's never perfect. You gotta, you gotta adapt on the fly too. That's the hard part for me. Um, but just constantly communicating and planning. So you're the, obviously the CEO of the program, right? I mean, that's, it's, everything's running through you, right? We talked earlier, a lot of coaches retiring. You're still young, right? Don't have any hobbies. Are you picking up hobbies or, or what? Uh, well, What's, what's the end, you know, what's the end? Is it coach to, to the wheels fall off or what, what's, what's the, what's the kind of fade off from the sunset exit strategy as, as the CEO? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I think that's good. I think it's good that I don't know the answer, right? Because I think that means that I, I don't have any intentions of not being involved with wrestling anytime soon. I, I, I love, I love wrestling. I love impacting kids' lives. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't know the end game. Um, I, it's, it, I don't have any intentions of walking away soon. Um, although I did say, you know, th- this year was uh, different for me because um, I had a daughter who was competing in high school and um, I've always tried to like kind of instill in her, like, 
you know, you just, you go, you put your best effort out there, you work hard and results are what they are. You don't need me in the stands. You don't need mom in the stands. You don't, you know, um, but there was a day this year, uh, we were getting ready to go to the district tournament and my, my kid, um, Drexel gymnastics is, is tremendous. And so I don't know a ton, but I'm learning. And so they, the top four in each event score points, but they compete six. And okay. so my daughter as a freshman got into the varsity lineup. Um, and they were able to make the state tournament. And so she was going to go and compete on the defending state championship team at the state tournament. And, um, I, I don't know, seeing her off that morning, I was leaving to go to districts and she, here's my kid. who's going to go to the state tournament compete. You only get four tries at this. And it was like, Whoa, that was, that was, um, that was a tough moment for me. Um, and so, you know, I was in the corner of the gym watching it live. You know, if there's a, if there's a, a silver lining to COVID is you can watch everything on film on live stream. Right? right. So I'm, I'm watching her compete while, you know, Brock Herman's on deck or whatever. Right. So um, this, that was challenging for me. Um, we did the beauty and the beast thing. I was just going to bring that up. You know, they did it at Kent after Zeb and I left, they did a beauty and the beast, but I remember talking to, to Bob over at the campsite, talking beauty <laughs> and the beast. And so how's, how's that work? It was so cool for me. Um, you know, just to have a mat on the floor and get your kids prepared to wrestle and walk up to the gym and, 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 you know, um, put, put, put your product out there, but yet there's my kid competing right there. It was, it was really, really cool for me. Um, better, better than I thought it was going to be. And you guys do that every year. It wasn't like a, just a COVID thing, right? You guys do it every year. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Either one of you can answer this question. You already know what this is. You know, you already know it's a, you already know it's a hashtag girl dad question. <clears throat> so how afraid are both of you that your daughters may eventually date wrestlers? I, you know, I don't know, Jared, if you get this question a lot, but I, I, a lot of people ask it and I'm not, I'm not afraid of that at all. Um, you know what I'm more afraid of? And, 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 I don't know, Jared, our situation is a little bit different, but being a, a head wrestling coach in the building, I'm afraid that my position is going to affect my kid's social life. You know, like, gotcha. well, yeah, like I hope, I hope it doesn't happen like that. Um, I, I see these wrestlers and um, I don't know. I, I know who they are and what they stand for and how hard they work. And um, they're just, they're good, goal-driven, hardworking people. That doesn't scare me. Um, I'm probably more afraid of the uh, the rest of the people. <laughs> I know that sounds backwards, but... <laughs> I'm afraid of the rest of society at large. Not I'm, I'm afraid of the other 50% of humans on the planet at large that, you know, yeah. uh, that, you, raise your, you raise your kids. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think most of the time the anticipation is worse than the reality. And you raise your kids with, you know, you know, I've, nobody, no parent is perfect, but you raise them a certain way and you, you know, they're going to make decisions on their own. And, you know, for the wrestler, it's a wrestler. And, you know, we, we've all been in their shoes. So you have something in common with them then. Right. That's I don't true. know. I mean, I'm just saying I've been around some real degenerates who have been <laughs> teammates of mine. And I'm just I've, I I've just been like, oh, man, I can't imagine. It's, it's, it's just a fraction of light. I mean, there's it's a representation yeah. of light, right? You do it. Go yeah. Down you're gonna yeah. I mean, that's how it is. That's how it goes. But it's just like, oh, man, I I don't know. I like sometimes I'll say to people that be like, oh, we're going to get our kid into youth wrestling. And I'm always like, get yeah, no to do that. Don't do that. It's a sickness. Don't do that. You don't have no idea what you're entering into, but you don't know this, you know, the, the level of commitment of those people. So it's hard to like even say that to them. Right. I mean, if it's my family's level of commitment and your guys's family's level of commitment to it, sure. That can become, that can maybe become a, t- a problem, right? Maybe a little bit of an illness. Did you come from a wrestling family? Zeb? <laughs> it's wild. Though. I mean, it's like, cause all three of us, you know what I mean? Such involved wrestling families. So, but did you, did you, have to wrestle? No, I mean, oh, no, 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 no. I, me? No, personally, I didn't have to. I wrestle. guess that's what I meant by like a wrestling family. Like you didn't have a choice. No, I, I didn't have to wrestle. No, I, me- I remember one year was crazy because like three years ago, my nephew Owen was on the basketball team. I think he did both in middle school at Oak Harbor. And I think he was just like a run back up and down the court guy. And he figured out really quick that, yeah, dude, this just nice. isn't you. This isn't your jam. We yeah. just had this conversation tonight, Drew and I, at practice of you know, uh, Michael Baxter. You remember Michael, right? Oh, it's Perkins. Yeah, yeah. He was up. We, we at practice tonight. And we were just talking, and he asked Drew, "Did you have to wrestle?" You know, because he wrestled Troy. Him and Troy had some battles back and forth, and, and same thing. I think Corey and Troy took like fourth and fifth grade off, or Troy didn't start to fourth grade, and Troy and Corey took sixth grade off. It was just my dad was just 
you know, here's what it is. You know, when we were super young, he'd pull us out, you know, now nah, you're good. It's on to baseball, but yeah, we didn't have to, but you know, my dad knew how to Jedi mind trick us. <laughs> Keep us well, going. The, the deal with my kids is we go to stuff and I create like real positive associations with it. Yeah. That was so the, when they know that like coach Varney's kid is Jeffrey, is Jeffrey going to be there? <laughs> then they're pumped because they're on the same T-ball team. They do everything together. Jeff, Varney makes everything real fun. So like creating positive associations. I mean, if, you know, cause I always pick everybody else's brain about, you know, parenting. And I think the big thing I've noticed is creating positive associations. Like I don't want them to dread this. I don't want them to hate this. My oldest son, Ferdinand is five. He just wants to be the best at everything. He wants to win every race. He wants to do the most pull-ups. He wants to, and it's just how he is. He's like my wife. He's built like my wife. He looks like my wife. Thank God for him. He's smart <laughs> like my wife. But he's, you know, he's very lucky in that sense. And he's super competitive like her. And there's nothing wrong with that. But like, I really got to dial him. I'm like, hey, man, you don't have to win everything. Yeah. You don't like they did. The, they were just doing laps. And it's it's, it's T-ball, right? It's T-ball. And he like had to beat everybody in the laps. And it like, I just don't want it to be unhealthy for him to the point where he's like, Oh man, why am I doing? I don't ever want him to have to question why he's doing it. I want him to just like love it. And I think building a passion for it and creating positive associations is is super important. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it fun and then have some around like Varney that's going to keep you honest and give you honest feedback. Like, Zeb, <laughs> this is yeah. what it is. And, you know, not someone's going to pump some sunshine up here. Yeah. And the other thing is, I saw like Shane Sparks, you know, every, every car ride home is, is, is how fun. Let's laugh on the car ride home, have be a positive car ride home. Let's not talk about what you could have done better and how you could have ran the bases better. You know, the car ride home needs to be fun. And I think that, that you know, that's not for every family, but I, th- I think that's great advice by Shane Sparks. Like, leave that behind, leave it behind. Whatever happened, leave it behind. And um, I think that's what that is, right? I think that's just like you're leaving it behind and we're not going to uh, reminisce on things or, or, kick a dead horse and let your kid keep reliving something maybe that didn't go their way. Right. It's a different time than if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. Right. Zeb? <laughs> that is the Miller family creed. <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> like a hundred percent. That's the creed, man. Isn't that in the firehouse? Oh uh, yeah. Family? Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Tate, Tate got a sign. He got like a Joe Glavin sign made. It is like, uh, if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. And that's him and my dad's. I mean, they're just, Smart guys who work in a frenzy. I have my neighbor, Bob. Today I was, okay. So like I stacked wood and uh, mowed the lawn and did a bunch of stuff all day today. And like, I have to have my neighbor, Bob over to like slow time down to me (laughs) to bring deep breaths and to analytically look at what we're trying to do. Right. My wife's, you know, she's real smart, but she's like, call Bob. Text Bob. Tell Bob to come over. And she Bob was an engineer. In your life, huh? Yeah, Bob's a metal was a metallurgist. He told me today he's a metallurgist for Lincoln Electric. Great guy. And Bob came over today, and he's like, "What do you guys want to do?" And I was like, oh, "I want to get the wood up off the ground because I'm I keep having chimney fires. It's because I'm burning wet wood. Chimney fire can burn your house down." Bob's like, "You need to get the wood up off the ground." Yes, I'm gonna build platforms. I was going to build like this big platform and screw the things in and do all this stuff. Bob's like, you don't need to do that. Take the boards. It was like four by fours, lay them across this, get it four inches off the ground. You don't need to elevate it as much. You're thinking you're overthinking this. The smart guy told me that. (laughs) And, you know, I figured it out, but like taking a step back from things. Right. And, and maybe getting a voice of reason. I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Anything in life. Right. I mean, who's your voice of reason, Todd? I, you know, I still still talk to Tim Armelli a lot, who was my high school coach. We just went to the Indians game last week. Um, but, you know, I, I told you Tom Mohol, who coached with me for years. He, he hasn't coached the last few years. He, he was is, big. Is Tom team. related to Jack? Yeah, they're brothers. Okay. Because yeah. Jack was Simmons' coach. Or Jack was the coach when I was at Riverside, yeah. like 05, 06, 07, right? Yep, yep, yep. So they're yep. brothers. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, Tom Mohol was a big one for me. Tim Armelli was a big one for me. Um yeah, I don't know. Tim Armelli was in the cafeteria. Yeah. For the Chardon when the kid came in and shot and killed four people. Did you yep. know that? Yep. 
how wild is that? Like how rattled would that have a lot of people? Like, I, and he was the athletic director at Chardon, right? Um, I don't think he was the athletic director. Uh, he was, he was a uh, phys ed and health teacher at Chardon. Okay. Um, and, and it was in the morning before school had started, yeah. you know, they were catching the bus to do, go to the VOED school. And I think he was just supervising the cafeteria when everything went down. How wild is that? Like that would rattle a lot of people and you'd never be able to enter that building again. Right. Like, I don't think you could get Tim Armelli to say a negative word about anything. It's the guy's amazing. He's a really good dude. Oh, uh, hold on. He says a lot of negative things about Chad Miller. Let's just get that out of the way. Uh, we're going Let's back. get that out of the way because Chad Miller cheated in the state <laughs> finals against John Volpe. Hey, that match. I'm going to send you that match after we get off here. It's on, I have it on my YouTube on Ohio. I'll send that to you. All right. And you can see the moment when he feeds Volpe a knee. <laughs> okay. And then Volpe uh, was out, I guess, was out because that's what Armelli, like he said, he woke or he was like, hey, what happened? Did I lose? <laughs> why am I, I, why I, am I, I going up on second me. place? I'd like to see that. I've, I've never seen. I've seen. You can see it. It's an out of bounds. You can see it. It's as blatant as all yeah. out. Like the ref was looking right at it. <laughs> yeah. And then Dale Caprosi had to win for like to win the state title in 89. It's okay. <laughs> Do you know who was the runner up? It was, it was, it was Oak Harbor, right? And it was Kenston. No? Oh, that's right. Cause in Rose Chad Talk, beat Chad beats the Kenston guy in the semis. My brother, Chad beats the Kenston guy mints in the semis. Chad makes this. Okay. So if mints beats Chad, Kenston wins. Yeah. Cause it's what's it four extra points. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. If Kenston dude mints beats Chad Miller in the semis, my brother, Kenston wins the team state title. Yeah. Chad Miller beats the Mints guy and whatever. You could probably go look at Kenston state tournament. They probably had five or six or seven guys, whatever they had. Cause that was a lot then back then in the eighties. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, so my brother Chad is a little bit responsible for Kenston not getting a state title, but hopefully my kids can help out with that. We'll see. I mean, we don't know, but yeah. So my brother Chad beats and Volpe was the best guy, I think. Because Vic Voinovich won 140 that year. Yeah, they had three finalists. Three Voinovich. finalists. They had Voinovich, Volpe, Caprosi, right? Yep. Yep. And two out of the three won. And the two that won weren't supposed to. Yeah, I guess, in theory, right? But yeah. Well, they I weren't, Bra- Brakeman didn't pick them to win. Yeah, yeah. And Charlie Bax, I think, was a sophomore uh, on the team and won like one match, right? But it was on the, it was like, a, it was two points and they won by like a half or something. Yeah. Like that. Wow. That's wild. It's a wild. Yeah. Like I, I told it to my brother and he's like, well, cause he's clueless. Huh? I'm like, yeah, you're, you'd still stay title from Kenston. I hate your guts. We live here now. <laughs> People all want to burn my house down. <laughs> he doesn't know what's going on though. <laughs> my brother. Hey, listen, how about this guy's beating cancer twice? My brother, Chad is tougher than a $2 oh. steak. I'll send you that match though. Cause it's, it's the, it's to some corny music. FYI, just mute the music. Yeah. Um, but it, you can see him feed him the knee. And it was it was the horrible rule set where Chad won on a criteria or something. Rife, referee's Refere's decision. decision. Criteria. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Nobody knows. Like, we at least know in the, like, well, not your match. Who is the match where, the guy, where, your guy, where your guy lost this year and they threw the brick and you're like, I don't know where that point came from. What was that match? That just happened to U16. Yeah. That was the Brock Herman match. Like Brock I- Herman lost a match similar to how John Volpe lost to Chad Miller in the state finals. You don't know how it happened. <laughs> Watch the, the, you're gonna watch it and be like, oh yeah, the Lake Catholic guy probably should have won. Even the Jersey coach when he threw it was like they joke called the, the Yo Yolo brick, right? Like, well, well, yeah, that's, that's what like, everybody does. Everybody does it at the end of the match because why not, right? Yolo, you only live once. Yeah, and so he was kind of laughing about it, like, well, whatever. And then they they awarded the one for him, and I thought it was they were meant to give one to Brock for lo- losing the challenge, and they were like, no, reversal. Like, we're, they're gonna crotch lift because like it, it was bizarre, but whatever. The best is when they're like. Coach, shut up and sit down. That's a, yeah. No, I just want an explanation. What happened? <laughs> Coach, watch it. I'm going to get this card out of my pocket or my fanny pack or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And you're just, no, I just, I just, what happened? Just tell me what happened. I want to, and you like genuinely just want an explanation. It's just like, shut up. I, I don't have to tell you anything. <laughs> That's weird. I don't get that. But hey, whatever. YOLO, right? Yeah. All right, Jared, do you got anything else for this? I'm guy? good. Thanks coach. I appreciate it. Thanks. For do you have, on. can you get us with a, a quick singlet special for barbarian apparel, please? 
Oh yeah. Uh, barbarianapparel.com slash BA hour. That's uh, the thing that special, you know, people gearing up for next year. Don't wait till last minute. Check out the coverage I just did with uh, head coach Hada showing. Te- hey, Hada's uh, was, 78 that, years old. Dude's still good. showing technique. It's amazing. He had your he had uh, some technique. Your, your, your mask on. Yes, and he was wearing a Ohio mask. Interview, interview was great, Zeb. Great job. It, it, he does a great job. Yeah, Hada's, does. Hada's awesome. And then Ian did a great job. And then I got to talk to Dylan Fishbeck. I got to talk to, talk to Gavin Brown. I got to talk to a couple different people, obviously Eric and Scotty. Check that out. And then I'm heading out to Washington, Idaho, North Idaho next week. Going to climb some mountains with K-Rob and uh, his brother-in-laws. Wait until, I got to do an interview with his brother-in-law, Kelly. The guy is like the best. The brother-in-law, Kelly, Kelly Moffat's one of the, he's a legend. He's a legend in North Idaho and Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I can't wait to send me your top to three there. videos from the, I can't, I can't watch every video you do I I tell you all the time. Just it's send me your top three. Consuming. Just send me three. Your top. I'll three. send you three. I'm going to send both of you the Chad Miller state. Farm all right. Yes, yeah, please do that. All right. Thanks. All right. Coach. We got anything else? I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Hello wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the division one level in the NCAA 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice.